Hi, I'm Jennifer Majerzyk. I'm a stroke neurologist, normally at the University of Utah, but I am a visiting professor through the Fulbright program here at the University of Newcastle in Newcastle, Australia. And with me today is another stroke neurologist, Dr. Carlos Garcia Esperon. And we're gonna talk about a paper that the journal Neurology has published recently. So thank you for joining me, Carlos. This is so nice. Thank you, Jenny. It's a pleasure. Um, so this paper is about cancer and stroke. And uh, Carlos and I were talking and thought maybe we would just set the stage with a, a case, uh, since he and I are both, both pretty busy clinicians, the kind of patient that we would see normally. So to the audience, we want you to imagine uh, that you're in the ER and a 60 year old woman comes in and she is five hours out from onset from her stroke. And she has a NIH stroke scale of 18 with classic left MCA syndrome. Mm -hmm. And her husband tells you the clinician that she was diagnosed with colon cancer, metastatic colon cancer a couple of months ago and is undergoing current treatment for it. Um, she does have an LVO. So Carlos, have you ever been in that kind of situation? Oh, I think of everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone have been in that one. Uh, difficult call, I think they are, uh, there's pretty little evidence about what to do in these patients. So I think that's something that this paper definitely will try to clarify a bit more and guide us about what to do for these patients and also how to inform the family about the possible outcome. Yeah, that's what I find is that the families will say, well, what can you do for my mom or my, my wife? And we know we have thrombectomy and that's a very effective uh, therapy in the general population. But then you have these subgroups and you know that probably metastatic colon cancer doesn't have a great prognosis, but you don't, or I'm just a neurologist, I don't really know. So Same. It, yeah, it can be difficult to make those decisions. And of course it's the heat of the moment. Mm, sometimes probably you find the same difficult to get all the information mm -hmm. you're rushing and probably the oncologic history is still a bit patchy. Right, you try to find the oncologist and you're thinking, time is brain, I gotta go. You're trying to get the oncologist on the phone. So um, yeah, so let's talk about this paper and um, maybe you can tell us, Carlos, kind of uh, what, what, how the study was designed. Yeah, it's a very nice study um, from, the, from the Dutch groups, from the Mr. Clean Registry. So it's a Mr. Clean Registry data comparing the outcome of EBT patients with active cancer versus those patients without cancer. Interesting to keep in mind and not confuse with those Mr. Clean original trial. This is started just after the original EBT trial in 2015. So it's a registry and then all patients had EBT, right? So there were yeah. no control patients. No control. Okay. So important that to keep in mind, that's probably would be, and we'll talk about that, some selection bias. Um, so they have a pretty tight and I think a quite fair active cancer definition, and it's probably important to go through that to the audience. Um, as cancer diagnosed in the prior 12 months, uh, metastatic disease, or any cancer treatment or treatment refusal in the prior 30 days, or palliative care for cancer. Important to flag that they excluded the non-invasive skin cancer Okay. That's a good example. So I was uh, enrolling in a trial once that said any history of cancer was excluded, but if they have a cancer that's 10 years older, they, that didn't count as active cancer, yeah. right? Okay. Correct. Um, large registry, around 2,500 uh, patients, and they had a 5% of them had an active cancer. Okay. Um, and they compared those patients that they, with active cancer, they were more disabled at baseline, 34% uh, MRS2 or greater than two versus 17%. That's a pretty big difference. It is indeed. And something that probably important to them at the time of the discussions, more often anticoagulated, we know about this population, so less likely to receive TBI. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, what did they find? Interesting. Among the patients receiving EBT for, for LBO, they compared to patients without cancer and the patients with active cancer, as probably we expected, they were less likely to be independent at 90 days. Okay. How much less? Like, what was the difference? Uh, they had an MRI 0 to 22.6% versus 42%. Okay. That's quite a difference there. Yeah. And unfortunately, more often dead, 52.2% versus 26%. And when we look at the sub-analysis of the palliative care patients, 80% of the patients with cancer died at three months. That fits what I've seen clinically. If you have a patient who comes in on palliative care, you do everything. Probably the initial yeah. decision-making by the family and the patient to go a palliative route will be continued, mm -hmm. meaning they will, they will pass. Absolutely. It's very sad, but 
it's a very interesting data. And I think that's something that is the group, the Dutch group is, they, do, they have a fantastic registry. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, EBT was safe. That's another of the questions. Are these patients more likely to bleed? Mm -hmm. Important to keep in mind that they were less likely to receive thrombolysis, mm -hmm. but still there was no increased symptomatic ICH in okay. this group. Even though they were more likely to be on anticoagulation. Correct. Okay. Well, that's, that's good. Um, so, uh, I think you said that one in four patients did well, um, but then half died hmm. and then a quarter did in the middle. Yes. Okay. All right. So what do you think? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I, I took a look and went back to the pivotal uh, EBT trials. And when you compare with the non-EBT um, of the Mr. Clean, Rivas Cut, Escape, Swift Prime, Extend IA. Mm -hmm. It's probably little in little difference in the outcome expected. So you have a 25% and just refreshing to the audience in the non-EBT arm of um, Mr. Clean, it was 19% MRI 0 to 2. So 19% in the original Mr. Clean original, yes. did well if they yes. didn't get thrombectomy. Correct. And then um, and in this group, 25% did well when they did get thrombectomy. So pretty close. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, interesting to take a look at the sub-analysis and when they compare active but intention to treat curative versus palliative. Uh -huh. As then you get up to a 32% in those with curative. Okay. So that's then removing the palliative patients. It got closer to a third of patients did well. That makes sense to me. Yep. Okay. Already starts to sound like something that would you start with this data to push towards treatment. Yeah, I mean, that's when I think, we were talking about this earlier before our recording, that you know, one of our biggest challenges is what to tell families in the ER, because you, like, like we were saying earlier, there's no time. But if I could say, well, if, you're, if your spouse is, if they're not on palliative care and you've got about a one in three chance of this improving them, having them be independent, that seems not bad to me. I agree. I think that's one of the very nice things that this paper brings. It brings, solid data and good numbers to be able to show with the family and something that at least I always felt, to be honest, fairly doubtful about how to manage these patients. Mm -hmm. So now I think that I have more resources, especially at the time of having that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, thrombectomy is expensive, but if, if by doing this, um, and keep in mind to the audience, these patients mostly couldn't get TPA because they were already on anticoagulation. So it's not like it's a one or the other. It's, this is the only option. But if you can give them function back, um, mm. and of course, cancer care is coming a long ways too. So cancers that used to be fatal are no longer necessarily fatal, but we're never going to know that in the ER. Yeah. I have a difficult question for you. Mm -hmm. What about, does this results change your management and, and your thoughts about the palliative? Yeah. So palliative care, um, I... I mean, it is, it, it's important to clarify with the family, what do they mean by palliative care? Mm -hmm. But generally they mean that we have, you know, the patient and the family has declined active treatment to prolong life, but they are still wanting treatments to have a good quality of life. But it does seem that in this patient population, it didn't really provide that. There was, it didn't increase quality of life for those patients. Um, so I, it's, I know that in my center and I'm sure in, in most uh, centers, we're watching the clock constantly, trying to make every minute count, but this might be a good time to take a step back and slow, to, slow it down a little bit to make sure that we're not doing an aggressive treatment that is incompatible with what they really want, mm -hmm. especially if it's not gonna help. Absolutely. Probably also important to remind we are talking about registry data. Mm -hmm. So probably would be some bias about these patients where- I was thinking that too, that the, uh, so keep, <laughs> there's no one in this, study who didn't get thrombectomy. So that means that when, uh, this was done in the Netherlands, so when mm -hmm. a patient in the Netherlands came in with cancer, there it's a good chance maybe the family chose against thrombectomy or the clinician, and that population isn't even represented here. So this isn't all comers. So that makes me think that this might be the, this is the best ones, but <laughs> it might be. It might be biased yeah. towards patients who they expected to have a better outcome. Absolutely. Definitely that's one of the limitations of this, of this mm -hmm. paper. What do you think about the sample size? They had, uh, since 2014, they were able to identify 124 patients. Many things happened. Technique change of thrombectomy, probably the management of the patients, many different cancer subtypes there. We're faster now too. Yes, we are. Uh, we have better systems of care. 
So that, to me, that implies that perhaps if this registry was started today, patients would do better. I don't mm -hmm. know what you think. Yeah. I think so. Um, the, the, the time frames and the definitely they have a very impressive door to needle. They have a very slick system. It's fantastic what they do as a network. Um, but the overall TQ2B, for instance, achieved was around the 65%. Mm. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that now these centers are achieving a higher proportion of TQ2B mm -hmm. and potentially it might play and might have an interact on this data. And it was, remind me, but it, their TQ outcomes were similar between the cancer and the non-cancer patients, mm. right? Do I remember that correctly? Yep. So it wasn't that the cancer clots were harder to get out. Didn't seem to be the case. Okay. Um, would you be interested? I, I would be personally uh, on hearing more about the cancer subtypes mm -hmm. and see which ones. Yeah, I think not. Clearly, not all cancers are the same, and um, and I think they point this out in the paper too that some of the cancer therapies themselves might make stroke more likely, but also things like creating vasculopathies, which could be mm. difficult to treat. So. Um, there might be some subtypes that are more resistant to thrombectomy uh, because of that. So uh, it would help to know so that you knew what, what type of patient you were dealing with. But I asked, uh, in preparation for this, I asked one of the oncology experts here mm -hmm. at University of Newcastle if there was overlapping cancer registry data with stroke registry data. And, um, apologies if I'm wrong, if there's some oncologist out there, but uh, uh, they, the person I was speaking to said that most of the cancer data doesn't focus on really detailed stroke outcomes. So he didn't think this like more detailed data was really available. Hmm. Interesting. What do you think? And this already that the authors bring in the discussion, any possible bias about probably a trend towards more active palliation in these patients during the admission, perhaps less likely to offer rehab after? Right. So what you know, Carlos is asking, so if someone's hospitalized and they have active cancer, do we then give them rehab? That must be quite center dependent. I know our rehab, uh, inpatient rehab at the University of Utah um, is, takes a broad spectrum of patients and they will absolutely take active cancer patients. But that often comes down to a one-on-one -on -one discussion. So if you're in a center where people say, you only have so many months, do you really want to spend that in a rehab center? Then it does seem less likely that they might decline and say, no, I just want to mm -hmm. go home. I've definitely been in the situation where we've done what we call a Hail Mary in our country. I don't know if that- Tell me about that. What's a Hail Mary? Yes. Uh, it's, a, it's a football term, which I don't actually watch football, but nonetheless, it means like a long shot. Like, we're gonna try this, hope it works and, and see what happens. And so sometimes thrombectomy can be along those lines, like mom was doing really well, even though she had cancer. Now she has the big one, you know, mm -hmm. stroke scale of 18. We're gonna try thrombectomy. And then within a day, if she's not up and walking again, they'll say, we don't wanna pursue further care. And that can be very discouraging for a team because we've done a lot of upfront work, but yeah. we would like to continue and to do rehabilitation and to hope for the best. But I think um, some of what you were implying, sometimes that's not according to family's wishes. And I think, I don't know if I speak for other clinicians, but one thing that I find frustrating is that we don't have time in the ER to, to really get into those issues. Mm, so absolutely. stroke is really frustrating. It's just, it's so fast and you make this life-changing decision and then the family changes their mind a day later. So I know our team struggles with that. Good point. Look, I think that there's a lot of very interesting data here, and at least it's going to change my practice. I will feel more reassured at the time of facing these patients. Yeah, I think if I could tell a family that despite your, you know, family member having a one in three or having active cancer, there's a one in three chance if, if they're not on palliative care that they'll have a good outcome. That's pretty, that's pretty good. It's not as good as I would like, but um, considering the depth of the disease, that doesn't seem too bad to me. Absolutely. So. We have more data. We know that it's safe mm -hmm. to go to EVT with these patients, not increase risk of symptomatic intracerebral hemorrhage. Yeah, that's, that's, right. pretty, that's pretty noble. I would like to ask you a question. Mm. Uh, is there a space for, definitely we need more registries. Is there a space for a randomized clinical trial here? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about these guys, they had 2,500 patients and 5% only had cancer. Um, so I don't design clinical trials, but I do think it would be a hard one. Probably will be a I think it'd be a hard one. I could see more work on the preventative end, you know, um, which they do do obviously, um, trying to decide which anticoagulants are best because that's still, you know, to my mind anyways, an unknown question, mm -hmm. which ones prevent stroke the best. 
So once this patient has had a stroke, now what? What do you do to prevent the next one? Because um, most of that data seems to come from the venous side, yeah. not from the arterial brain side. So that there might be room for. Um, but even then, the numbers probably get pretty small pretty fast. Great. Well, Carlos, thank you for taking time today to talk Thanks about this. Thanks so much this. for inviting me. Yeah, it has been a pleasure. We're excited. And to the AAN, thank you for allowing us to discuss this thank paper. You. And we'll see you all, I don't know, at the next meeting or online, so. I guess. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Take Good care. Goodbye from Australia. Bye-bye.